Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just briefly remind you of uh, what we've been up to lately. And um, um, again, since we had a few days um, since the last lecture, I'll just make a very brief recap of the last week. We we're talking about light matter interaction and uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics, light matter interaction in cavities. And last week, uh, we basically introduced James Cummings Hamiltonian, uh, which describes the interaction between single emitter and the field. And then we used uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian to study strong coupling regime of cavity quantum electrodynamics. And in that regime, uh, we, we basically first solved it without losses. We solved it in time domain, where we uh, discovered this Rabi oscillation that if you put an emitter in the excited state, let it decay, it emits a photon, photon is reabsorbed, um, then you know the emitter would then decay again, emitter photon, reabsorb photon back. So there is this, uh, exchange of energy between the light and uh, um, uh, between our optical field and the emitter that uh, goes on forever in a lossless system. And of course, in a lossy system would be damped oscillation. So this is what we call Rabi oscillation. We solved for that. And then we also solved for the problem in frequency domain when we found out that new energy eigenstates of the system would appear and that if you look at the transmission through the system, you would not really see, see a single cavity resonance, but you would see it split into two peaks um, that correspond to these integral states of light and matter. So um, you know, just briefly summarizing this Rabi oscillation, to find Rabi oscillation, we solved time dependent Schrodinger equation with Hamiltonian being described with the James Cummings Hamiltonian, and we solved for the wave function expanded in terms of the eigenstates of the original system where there is uh, no coupling between light and matter. And we found out uh, basically that these uh, probabilities of the system being in one of these original eigenstates, excited state of the atom and photons in the cavity or ground state of the atom and plus one photons of the cavity follows this um, oscillation with frequency 2g square root of n plus 1, where n is the number of initial number of photons and g is basically the coupling strength, uh, light um, and matter coupling strength, atom, atom field coupling. Um, and also we um, solved for the problem uh, in frequency domain. Uh, that's what we did last time. And in frequency domain, we found new energy eigenstates of the system. New energy eigenstates of the system are now entangled states of light and matter. They're not anymore just pure product states of, of atom and the field states, which are Fox states, but now you have these hybridized states, which are both states of light and matter. You cannot really factor out states of, of atom and states of field. And um, for um, uh, particular rung, you know, of the ladder, and there are many different rungs corresponding to different number of excitations, um, different n. Uh, the states would be described as here. Uh, they're basically um, combinations of exn, gn plus one with plus or minus sign. And the corresponding eigen energies are given here. And you see that the new eigen energies corresponding to these states uh, basically split off around the original eigen energies and the separation depends on the rank and it's proportional to two h bar g square root of n plus one, right? So that's the splitting of new eigenstates in each rank. Uh, we call these new eigenstates dress states and original eigenstates are called bare states um, of the system. And that's basically why uh, when we plot all of these new energy eigenstates, they form a ladder, which we call dressed states ladder. So if you look at the system without any detuning, meaning that atom is on resonance with the cavity field, uh, the new energy eigenstates would form the dress states ladder shown here. So, you know, you start from emitter, which is two level atom, one cavity mode, which is a harmonic ladder, all the levels are separated by H bar omega. But when, when you strongly couple these two, you have unharmonic ladder shown here. So first rung separation 2G, second rung separation 2G root 2, then you would have 2G root 3 and so on. And they all of these basically split off around certain state corresponding to integer number of excitations, right? Omega naught, h bar omega naught, two h bar omega naught, and so on. So as you as you go higher up the ladder, you see that the separation between the different energy eigenstates is not constant, and that's why we refer to this as unharmonic ladder. So the ladder of dress states is unharmonic ladder. 
Of course, you can plot that ladder also away from uh, detuning equal to zero. I mean, we have the full expression here that we derived, and away from that detuning equal to zero, you will actually also have these entangled states of light and matter, but the separation would actually vary in proportion with, with uh, uh, delta. Uh, detuning, actually not exactly delta, but square root of delta squared plus a constant corresponding to, to a particular rung. And this is how it would look, for example, for, for a quantum dot strongly coupled to the cavity. Uh, and then at the, the end of the last class, we started discussion of what happens with losses, right? Because the whole discussion so far was just for a lossless system. So we solve for Rabi oscillation in a lossless system. We solve for energy eigenstates of the lossless system. But the question was how to handle losses. And the easiest way to handle losses is uh, uh, by um, just introducing losses as imaginary part of frequencies, eigenfrequencies of atom in the field. So that's a little bit of a semi-classical uh, approach. Uh, we will treat this more rigorously later, but it's, we'll see that we pretty much obtain the same conclusions for most of the situations. But for now, we will just uh, repeat what we did last time, where we introduce losses of the cavity, uh, cavity field decay rate, and losses of the atom into everything other than the cavity mode, which is this uh, atomic line bit, gamma. We introduce them as imaginary part of the frequencies of the atom in the field, right? Um, then we plug that back into the expression for energy eigenstates, which we already uh, described and found, right? So we just plug in that frequency of the atom has imaginary part, which comes from the atomic line bit and atomic decay into non-radiative channels or everything other than the cavity mode. Uh, cavity frequency also has imaginary part, which comes from the cavity field decay rate, uh, just losses of the system. And when we plug that into the solutions for new eigenfrequencies that we found, we obtain this expression. And we started analyzing that expression in the condition when G is much greater than kappa and kappa is much greater than gamma. And we'll actually go back to this expression today and analyze it also for big coupling regime. But in the regime where the coupling strand G exceeds losses of the system, so G is greater than cavity field decay rate and cavity field decay rate is much greater than the atomic climate. So atom is the narrowest in the system, cavity is broader, but coupling between atom and the cavity is the strongest, right? In that regime, for detuning, for detuning equal to zero, the new eigenfrequencies would be given by this expression. And you see that really you, you have new real part of the frequencies, new eigenfrequencies, where G is greater than kappa half, right? Where kappa is cavity field decay rate. I mean, I label cavity field decay rate as kappa, which is omega over 2q. Um, so when G is, much, is greater than kappa half, you have new real part of frequencies. And these are the new uh, eigenstates of the system. So that gives you the condition for strong coupling that, because you would not really have new real part of frequencies and you would not see splitting in the spectrum unless G is greater than kappa half, okay? And then line bit is given by this extra term here, imaginary term, which gives you line bit of these uh, new eigenstates. So the splitting would be roughly 2G, assuming G is much greater than, than, than kappa half, or it would be basically 2 um, square root of g squared minus kappa squared over four. So that's the separation between these two peaks and their line width would be equal to kappa, right? So half of the line width of the, the actual cavity, which is in blue here, which has a line width of two kappa because kappa is cavity field decay rate. Okay, does that make sense, right? So that's why these red curves have line widths that are half of the blue curve. Right, that's all obvious from this expression. And well, in higher rungs, I mean, if you derive that for higher rungs, then line width would depend as n times kappa, which is why when we actually plotted this dress state slider, let me just go back um, quickly, you see that these curves are broader and broader as you go high up. So higher rungs decay faster. Okay, so that's something we analyzed last time. Um, you, it's kind of uh, an easy way to see what is going on in the system when you have losses and you can, we can use this expression again to see what happens in the weak coupling regime. I should just, and I warned you last time and I'll warn you again not to, 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 not to believe not to believe this expression in every possible regime. I mean, it, it, it can explain what happens, for example, in this regime or weak coupling regime and so on. But, you know, if you look at this, then you would think that 
kappa equal to gamma, if that somehow cavity losses can, can cancel atomic losses and system would always be strongly coupled no matter how large these losses are. That's not true, so don't, don't believe that. That's just a consequence of, of how we kind of address the problem artificially here. Uh, you still need to have coupling strength greater than both of these losses in order to, to enter the strong coupling. Okay, any questions about this? Uh, what is the y-axis of that plot? Of this plot? Yes. So this is, in, I labeled it as R, or I mean, I said transmission through the system. I, the, you can say it's either transmission or reflectivity, uh, because it depends on how you are collecting the signal. So it's just a signal from the cavity, right? I mean, it could also be luminescence if you have some active material there. Um, when you're measuring transmission or reflectivity of the cavity, you can either see Lorentzian or inverted Lorentzian, depending how you put your detector and collect signal. So here, I mean, I'm referring to it as transmission because that's kind of easier to understand, but I took it from a paper uh, that we wrote a while back where actually we were looking into reflect reflection, but it doesn't matter. Reflection and transmission is kind of the same thing. It just depends on what you're collecting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Any other questions? If not, I'd like to now spend a little bit of time going through some examples that illustrate all of the, the theory that we went through so far. And uh, I will uh, use as an example quantum dot inside of the cavity, uh, strong coupling regime actually for a quantum dot inside of the cavity. So the quantum dot would be indium arsenide, trunk of semiconductor indium arsenide, surrounded by gallium arsenide. And then there is a photonic crystal cavity in gallium arsenide, right? And this is, a, we have photonic crystal mirrors. This is how the field would look like. Uh, and experimentally, um, people have reached strong coupling regime for this particular system, which is why we will use it as an illustration of, of everything we discussed so far, right? And you can analyze strongly coupled system by the James Cummings Hamiltonian we introduced before, right? And this quantum dot, you can view as an artificial atom. I mean, because indium arsenide has a smaller band gap than gallium arsenide, you know, for electrons and holes that are inside of that chunk of material, they would basically be like electrons and holes, so basically electrons inside of a quantum box, right? So, so they can only occupy discrete energy levels. So you really have discretization of, of possible states for that quantum dot. Uh, and, but, you know, of course, physics would be exactly the same if you have the neutral atom or, or ion or, or any other, um, you know, single quantum emitter embedded here. And the cavity, I mean, you've seen already photonic crystal cavities, you're even looking into them in the homework, but we'll discuss them a little bit later on. You know, photonic crystal cavities are, are very interesting for these experiments because they localize light into very small volume. And we all know that coupling strength between light and matter uh, scales as one over square root of the mode volume. So if you have a small mode volume, you can ramp up this uh, coupling strength and Rabi frequency. Um, and they can also have decent quality factor, which means that cavity field decay rate omega over 2q can be pretty low, right? But you know, I mean, it's not as large uh, uh, q factor as in some other types of the cavities, but there is kind of a best trade-off between q factor and, and mode volume. And uh, emitter itself has also what we call dipole decay rate, which we label with gamma. The line width of the emitter is two gamma, right? So that's kind of natural line width of the emitter. Uh, and um, this comes from, from spontaneous emission rate, from the decaying to non-radiative channels. Uh, for these quantum dots, we generally have this line width of the emitter being much, much smaller than cavity field decay rate. So in order to get to strong coupling regime, you have to make G greater than kappa, okay? Or kappa half, actually, precisely. Okay, so just to illustrate what I told you, here is, here is how everything looks like, right? So this is a photonic crystal cavity in gallium arsenide. It's a suspended membrane, so you localize light particularly by total internal reflection, this is a field pattern, um, and this, this particular case, we have a mode that has an optical mode volume of 0.7 cubic optical valence. So this is lambda over 7 cube, and n is refractive index of, of gallium arsenide, which is around 3.6. And cavity, I mean, this cavity mode is around 900 nanometers. These quantum dots are also around 900 nanometers. Um, and quality factor is pr pretty good. I mean, you, you'll see that you need Q factor. You don't need very ultra high Q factor. You, Q factor of 10,000 or more is enough to reach the strong coupling regime in this system because mode volume is, is pretty small. 
And then your emitter or kind of matter um, uh, in light matter interaction is this quantum dot in a lateral dimensions are around 20 nanometers, vertically few nanometers. Indium arsenide has smaller band gap than gallium arsenide. So if you took like quantum mechanics or any you know, other classes looking into kind of applied quantum mechanics to semiconductor physics, you would have solved quantum box problem and found that eigenstates of uh, this electron inside of the quantum dot are discretized. And it's not only for electron, it happens both in the conduction and valence band, right? Yeah, so it happens both for electrons and for, for, for holes. So when these electrons and holes recombine, you have discrete transitions. It's really like in atom. And uh, uh, physics of quantum dots is more complicated. The, I mean, there is also a correction to those energy levels coming from interaction between charged particles. If you're interested in details of that, you know, that chapter, book chapter on archive that I referred to you, uh, referred you to that I wrote a while back has more discussion of this, you know, Coulomb interaction and correction to energy levels. We will not really go into the excitonic states. I'll just say that, you know, there are discrete energy levels and this is the ground state of the system, which we call neutral exciton state. It's single electron and single, single hole. And, you know, the point here for what we discussed before is that this is really like an atomic transition. Uh, line width of this is 2 gamma, line width of the cavity resonance is 2 kappa, but you already see that this is narrower than, than kappa, right? So atom is much narrower than the cavity, right? And we, which means that we are in the regime that we analyzed for that system with losses. When gamma is much smaller than kappa, but then we have to make g greater than kappa half in order to reach strong coupling, okay? So uh, when you make you know, this system and you embed this quantum dot in the cavity and quantum dot will be kind of in the, grown in the middle of this gallium arsenide slab and you know, positioned somewhere inside of this region to optimize coupling, then you can reach strong coupling. And typical experimental results uh, that, that we got were something on the order of, uh, of given here. I'm writing g over 2 pi here because all of this g is basically uh, angular frequency, right? So g over 2 pi is frequency in hertz, right? I mean, the way you remember that uh, when you write the interaction Hamiltonian, h bar g gives you energy of interaction, right? So which means that g is actually angular frequency, right? So g over 2 pi, this is just to be precise, right, when you're writing numbers. So g over 2 pi is given in hertz, and we measure something on the order of 10 to 25 gigahertz. Um, and then kappa over 2 pi for the cavity, which is defi defining cavity field decay rate, again, uh, is 8 to 16 gigahertz. And then gamma over 2 pi, which is half line width of your quantum dot, is typically less than gigahertz. So you have very narrow emitter. You have pretty lossy cavity, but g is still can be greater than kappa half, okay? So um, in that regime, when G exceeds kappa half, but we know G is already much, much greater than gamma, you expect to see Rabi oscillation, you know, in time domain, you expect to see splitting. I mean, when you measure transmission through cavity, you expect to see it split into these two peaks and, you know, maybe even see higher order peaks of the dress states ladder. And you actually definitely expect to see unharmonic ladder of dress, dress states. Right, so that's the signature of the strong coupling. So let's now go through the experiments that illustrate that, right? So the first thing, strong coupling, right? Uh, what do we expect to see? Uh, well, we expect to see that as we tune quantum dot onto cavity resonance, right? If the system is strongly coupled, you will see, you will not see it cross, you will see anti-crossing. Okay, and you see anti-crossing um, because there is a formation of these new entangled states of quantum dot and the cavity field, right? And in this case, you will see at low excitation powers, you see the first rank where the splitting is 2G, okay? So here exactly that's, that's what is done here. Uh, quantum dot is tuned onto cavity resonance and it crosses cavity resonance. And this tuning is done by temperature tuning because temperature affects quantum dot resonance much more than cavity resonance by a factor greater than three because the uh, quantum dot resonance depends basically on the 
uh, dependence of the band gap of indium arsenide and gallium arsenide for fluid temperature. And that's much stronger dependence than refractive index of gallium arsenide. And this is done at temperatures under 20 Kelvin, right? But it's not important. There are other ways of tuning quantum dot onto the cavity, as I'll show you later. Anyway, we tune quantum dot, cavity resonance is not really changing. It's changing a little bit. But you see when they get on resonance, they don't cross, right? They anti-cross. So what here, I mean, as you look at this, and this is measuring transmission through the system, OK? What do we expect? to read from this, right? So first, this line here, what is, what is the line width actually of the line when they're detuned very far from each other, right? I mean, what is the line width of this particular line, the broader line? What, what can you get from this? Gamma? Actually, kappa from kappa. this and gamma from this, but you're right, right? Loss is in the system. So this would be two gamma, this would be two kappa, right? And then as they, they get on resonance, what do you expect to see? What is the line width of each of these if they're strongly coupled? They should be equal, right? Because you get mu hybridized states of light and matter, and line width should be kappa plus gamma divided by two, OK? So there you see that they both become equal. And the splitting should be what? 2G. 2G, exactly. And then here we plot temperature on the horizontal axis, but of course detuning between quantum dot and, and the cavity is directly proportional to temperature. So you can view this horizontal axis as, as detuning. So here is gamma, he, this would be kappa, right? And this is this is two three. And that's what you read these experimental results, you know, you can actually that I mentioned were read from the plots like this for the different systems. Okay, was there a question? Um so um if the uh, for example, if temperature is 27K, um, then well, what is the eigenstates in this system? Can we treat quantum dot and cavity separately? Yes, yes. If you are, if you are very detuned, far detuned, you can pretty much treat them separately, right? I mean, uh, as you approach, and so in this regime here, you can treat them separately. As you approach this region, they're starting to interact more and more, and you can't treat them separately. But of course, it's not a sharp transition. There is a soft transition here. Yeah. yeah. But for large detuning, these this are pretty much uncoupled states of light and matter. So um, it, there is another important thing here. I mean, those are experimental details that as your temperature increases to something over 40 Kelvin, you start thermally exciting carriers from quantum dots. And, you know, you may, if you have a very careful eye, start noticing, you know, that this line gamma would get broader and broader as you, as you go there and eventually you don't really have quantum dot. So there is a regime. There are some other things that are popping up as you go to very high temperatures, but that would be beyond the range uh, that is studied here. Okay, or are there any other questions? So, so of course, I'm talking here about quantum dot in the cavity field, uh, but you can actually do these experiments in other platforms, right? You, atomic cavity QED, you know, people have done those experiments with large atomic cavities, but more recently there have been, has been effort at, uh, to, to couple quant um, atoms, neutral atoms to photonic crystal cavities, circuit QED, um, uh, so that, that's basically the experiments in the microwave regime with Josephson junctions um, and, you know, that at Stanford also there, there is a lot of work. Um, nice work on, on circuit QED in Amir Safavina and his group, but these are some of the earlier uh, groups that did effort in that, that space. Uh, so, you know, um, when you, we have a strongly coupled system, you can actually do a lot of interesting things and we'll go through, through a few different experiments uh, today. We'll be primarily in looking into this uh, generation of different state quantum states of light, right? And probing of this unharmonic ladder of dress states. And also I show you how this strongly coupled system can be used also for kind of classical switching applications, making optical switches and modulators that operate at very low energies, very low powers. Um, so first dress states ladder, right? I mean, when you have strongly coupled system, we said, uh, I mean, what we showed, so far was just this formation of the first rung of the dress state slider, right? That's what this plot was that I showed you. Right? So that's this thing here, right? Um, and you know, don't I mean, don't worry too much that these 
two curves don't look exactly the same. Of course, this is wavelength. Here I'm plotting frequencies, so things are a little bit flipped, right? I mean, this is exactly, but curves are exactly the same. And also this is temperature, not exactly the tuning, but the tuning is proportional to temperature. This is basically the same curve, right? Just experimentally obtained. But of course, you know that in dress states ladder, we also have higher ranks, right? So where are they here? Right, I mean, because you know, even if you couple two classical os oscillators, you may see something that people that looks like this anti-crossing. When when you were talking about coupled mode theory and coupled resonators and looking at that in homework, you would see some curves like this. But that's not really signature of any light matter entanglement. It's just coupling of two resonators. If you have strong coupling regime of quantum dot in the field, then you should also see these higher ranks of the ladder. And there are different ways of seeing that, right? I mean, one thing that we discussed last time was, well, if I crank up the power, then I should start doing multi-photon excitation of the higher ranks. Um, and uh, that's, that's one thing. And the other thing that you can do is you can probe, uh, kind of still do the same thing, change excitation frequency, and look at the transmission of light through the system and statistics of, of transmission which is easier to do for these particular systems because they're lossier than atomic cavity QED system, right? So, so here, uh, here is that idea. Um, and this is the idea behind what is called photon blockade and photon tunneling. Um, but it's basically probing of the dress states ladder, which you can also use to generate quantum states of light, right? So when we remember that when we introduced this ladder, we said it's unharmonic, right? So, so separation between different levels is not constant. So if you take a frequency corresponding to this first, one of the first rung eigenstates, that would not really reach any other eigenstates in the ladder because eigenstates are omega naught plus minus G, to omega naught plus minus g root two and so on, right? So there is this square root of n number that you are adding for n rank, which is messing up and, and making it unharmonic. But that's a good thing, as you see in a moment, because it's nice to have an harmonic ladder. I mean, it's nice to have something that is not just harmonic oscillator. Um, so when you, when you drive this, right? When you drive this state, remember that these states are basically from, from our solution for energy eigenstates of the system, these states are EX0 plus minus G1 over root two, right? And then these states are EX1 plus minus G2 over root two, right? And so on. These are energy eigenstates of the system. They're entangled states of atom and some number of excitations in the cavity field. Right, there are entangled states of atom in the field. So these states here are EX0 plus, zero plus G1 over root two, which means that if you drive these states, you can, put, you, you can put at most one quantum of excitation, one photon, right? The next photon would have to go to the next rank. It's the same thing in harmonic oscillator, right? Except that in harmonic oscillator, all of these are harmonic. So, you know, first photon goes onto the first um, ladder, step of the ladder, second on the second step, and so on. But here, the problem is our steps are not uniformly separated. So if I put the first photon here, I have no step for the second photon, right? So what's happening? I mean, let's say we drive this with a laser, right? What's statistics of the laser? Laser is coherent light source, right? So do we have precisely defined number of photons in the laser pulse? We don't, it follows Poissonian statistics, okay, right? So, so number of photons, all, the only thing that we can control when you get a laser and you turn your power knob is the average number of photons in the system. You can't produce specific Fox state at the output because you have, always have Poissonian statistics. So if you drive this with a laser, from that input laser, one photon would be coupled here and all the other photons we have no other steps on the ladder to couple to. So if in cartoon-like image, this is what would happen. So let's say we have a quantum dot in the cavity. You couple, pump it here, and each of these envelopes illustrates some number of photons in the input pulse, right? Which would be varying pulse per pulse in a laser. But let's say you have three photons, right? One photon would couple in. And once that photon couples, the others would be blocked from entering. Once the first photon couples here, there would be no steps for other photons, 
Does that make sense? At this particular frequency, just at that particular frequency. So you couple first photon, right, here. That's, there is an eigenstate for that one, but there are no eigenstates for the other one, right? Which means that other ones are blocked from entering and that's what we call photon blockade. And that, that first one that you coupled because there was eigenstate for it would kind of be here, recircle it and write get admitted at you, admitted at the output channel so you can actually collect it and, and measure it. So if you kind of drive the system at this frequency and you look what happens at the output, you will see you will not really see Poissonian statistics, which is signature of the laser. You will just see single photons coming through. And that's the regime of photon blockade, right? And then you can change the driving frequency. And let's say you drive with the frequency given by the red arrow, where we are two photon transition, you are reaching second rank, okay? And there you can place precisely two photons, right? Because these states are EX1 plus G2, plus minus G2 over root two. So at this frequency, if you drive the system at this frequency, let's say you have three photons in the input laser pulse, you can couple precisely two, kind of recirculate, emit into the output channel, but if you have extra photons, they'll be blocked from entering. If you have fewer than three, two photons, you can't couple to this transition because you have no levels to couple to. Okay? And that's what we call photon tunneling. So, these uh, actually experiments are important for probing the unharmonicity of dry states ladder, but obviously they're changing statistics of light at the output, so you can use them to generate some interesting quantum states of light, single photons or two photons, or you know, if you drive third rank, three photons. And um, this photon blockade was actually first demonstrated at Caltech uh, in the group of Jeff Kimball in 2005 in atomic cavity QED system. And, and then we demonstrated it at Stanford a few years after that in 2008. And then in circuit QED, it was demonstrated um, uh, in 2011, actually. So, so, so there, it's been demonstrated in several different platforms. In 2012 was another demonstration at ETH using Indimarsan, Almarsan quantum dots. So, so it's been demonstrated in multiple platforms so far, you know, some semiconductors, superconductors, or, or atomic cavity QED. Um, so now, you know, going back to this, just to remind you, if you're in the regime of photon blockade, you're kind of expecting to see single photon transmission at the output. So if you measure statistics of photons, right, uh, then you should see what we call anti-bunching. And we spoke briefly about single photon sources and how you measure it using this Hanbury brown and twist type setup that's used to just measure second order correlation function. So you have a beam splitter followed by two detectors and you measure coincident clicks of the two detectors. So if you have really one photon coming in, that photon cannot be split. It would go into one detector or the other detector. So you'll never have coincident clicks of the two detectors, right? So you expect to see absence of coincident clicks. And you know, if you measure it just simply by driving the system exactly at the frequency that I show you here, here, this one here, the blue line, right? Exactly driving the first rung. This is what you would kind of see, right? So this is the statistics. Uh, these bars are separated by 13 nanoseconds, which is the repetition period of the driving laser. Uh, if you measure this for a laser, you'll just see bars that all have the same height. Here, the central bar is lower, which means it's not really Poissonian statistics, it's sub-Poissonian. It's not a perfect single photon source, right? It's a press, but not a perfect single photon source. Um, but it's not a laser, right? So you decrease the probability of seeing, um, of seeing multiple photons come simultaneously, uh, emitting simultaneously from the system. And if you do measurement of, of this same thing in the photon tunneling regime, where, for example, you expect pairs of photons to be preferentially transmitted, this is what you would see. You see the central peak rising over the background, right? And this is what you call super Poissonian statistics. And again, for laser, it's all flat, perfect single photon source, this is missing. And super Poissonian statistics, statistics means that you, are, you have uh, statistics of light where you chances of having a pair of photons, you know, bunches of photons increase relative to, to a laser. And that's indeed the case here because your, your photons don't get transmitted as single photon anymore, right? You, you have to have pairs of photons in order to, to measure this. Um, um, could you explain again on the region of photon tunneling? Um, 
why there's the two photon for uh, photon tunneling yeah i think the, the plot if let you go actually back to this plot maybe it's not completely clear i mean it's uh, the lines are overlapping a little bit and that also happens in in reality but this line here you're driving it with the frequency which exactly drives the second rung right and eigenstates in the second rung are the, the eigenstates basically these eigenstates are ex1 plus minus g2 so you can put at most two photons there right so they they were formed by coupling um, Box states of light n equal to one and two and excited and ground state of the atom. So if you drive the system with a frequency where we have two photon transition, you get there, right? You can exactly place two photons there. You can't place more than two photons there. Okay. Same as for the photon blockade, where you can, you can put at most one quantum of excitation, right? So this, at this frequency, you can place at most two photons there. It's a transition that supports mostly two excitations. And that's why when you are driving the system with the laser, you would basically see two photons preferentially transmitted through the system. You cannot see one photon because if your laser, you know, just had one photon at this frequency, I mean, it's not clear from here because it seems like you can couple to something, but ladder is unharmonic. It would miss basically first trunk. It will uh, be more visible. This one would miss the first trunk and it will be more visible when we plot it for the detuned system, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. One photon has no states to couple to. Okay. So, you know, going back to this for blockade regime, you expect sub Poissonian. For tunneling regime, you expect super Poissonian statistics. And, you know, if you plot the central peak as a function of um, laser frequency, basically, you can see transition between blockade and, and tunneling regime. And for just laser, if you just detune laser and, and scan it through an empty cavity and measure statistics, you'll just see one always, right? But if you have a strongly coupled system, this is what you see. This is a regime of blockade, this is a regime of tunneling and going back to blockade. So that was the first thing that, that we measured a while back, you know, in 2008. But then, you know, it's, you can say that this is not a very good single photon source because you suppress the multi-photon probability not by much, right? It's almost like a, a Poissonian source again. It's not a very strong effect. And the reason why it's not a very strong effect is because if you look at the blockade regime, right? I mean, the system is unharmonic. So you, in ideal case, you would miss this second rung at the frequency which you use to drive the first rung for photon blockade. But remember, everything has some line bit, right? which comes from losses in the system. And higher order rungs have larger line widths than the first rung. So although it seems in ideal system, I'll miss the second rung here and I can't couple anything, I can still couple something. Okay, I mean, there is still some probability that I couple to tail of these angular states, which is why you don't see G2 of zero equal to zero, but you see 0.85, right, when you drive it here. But if you actually drive the same, do the same thing and drive the same first rung, but in a little bit detuned regime, I mean, this unharmonicity is a little bit larger for a detuned system. So you miss the second rung by a little bit more. So if you look at this, you expect that in the detuned case, you will see better single photon source, right? Smaller G2 of zero. And indeed, if you measure the same thing in the detuned case, this central peak is more suppressed, okay? So that's photon blockade is stronger. So that's, that's really nice. And, you know, you can uh, suppress it all the way to something like 10%, right, of the, of the uh, multi-photon probability um, in the blockade regime. So, you know, it's nice to see that really this is, this is happening. And apart from, you know, the fact that you're generating single photon stream here, what is also important is that you are proving that this is really a quantum mechanical state, right? It's, uh, it's really entanglement between atom and the field. Because if you just had two coupled resonators, you would see something that looks like this first rung of the ladder. You see this Rabi splitting, normal mode splitting, right? But if you take a laser and drive one of the resonators in the system of two coupled resonators, right? And if you measure statistics of light at the output, it's always a Poissonian statistics. There is nothing in the system that would change statistics of photons at the output. 
right? because there are no higher ranks of the ladder that are unharmonic. That comes from, from the fact that you have atomic state coupled to the system. But you know, in this case, when you measure statistics, you're seeing these changes in statistics depending on your driving frequency and, and depending on where you are in the ladder. So this is the proof that you indeed have this dry state slider, which is basically property of, of cavity quantum electrodynamics in the system. It's not a classical phenomenon anymore. It's a quantum phenomenon. Does that make sense? Yeah. So just she seeing something, I mean, the bottom line is just seeing something that looks like this is not implying any light matter interaction or strong coupling. I mean, sometimes people call it a strong coupling, but it's just strong coupling between two classical oscillators. You, to prove that you really have strong coupling regime of cavity quantum microdynamics, you have to prove that you really have this unharmonic ladder of dress states and that you, and you can probe it either through, you know, seeing, observing these higher order states pop up in your transmission spectrum, which people have done in atomic physics or circuit QED, or you can actually measure this statistics at the output, which is changing. Okay. So now, you know, I, I said I'll say a few words also about this, uh, um, you know, applications of this on, on fast switching. Um, since we're kind of halfway through the class, maybe I just make a brief break here and, and then we continue afterwards. And of course, happy to pick up any questions if you have them. Um, is there other way to demonstrate our devices in the quantum region? Yes, yes. So, so the other regime, the other way of demonstrating uh, is just if you go back here, right, is that as you are, let me just go back to this first plot. Okay, so you know here, of course, when you're driving in the uh, weaker excitation regime, you would see basically um, as you are scanning your frequency, laser frequency, what do you see? You see one peak and you see the other peak. You see cavity resonance split into two peaks, right? But then, you know, at the frequency where, where we have two photon excitation, you can reach the second rank, like this frequency, right? At those frequencies, you should see additional peaks, okay? In the transmission spectrum. So this peak, for example, should be at two omega naught, plus g root two divided by two, okay? Which is omega naught plus g root two over two, right? So if you look at the transmission spectrum of the system, if I go back here, that would be in between these peaks. So all of, as you, so basically the other way to see the whole dress states ladder is that you measure transmission through the system and in low power regime, you see first rank and then you crank up the power and you will start seeing higher order ranks as additional peaks or, you know, these Rabi uh, split curves in between these curves in the first rank because they correspond to multi-photon transi transitions and actually you have to plot them normalized by the number of photons that you are, you are using for excitation. So they will pop up here at higher powers. You can't see that for quantum dot system because it's too lossy. So, so you will see, I mean, I'll show you in a moment, you kind of see the effect of that as this kind of deep peels up as you crank up the power. But in atomic systems and in circuit QED people, as they crank up power, they start seeing additional peaks in between the original two peaks, you know, and, or, you know, if you, if you go back to, to this, um, let's see this one. This thing here, you know, at low power, you see splitting of cavity resonance into two peaks and then you crank up power and then you see another pair of peaks and then yet another pair of peaks and so on. I can send you the paper if you're interested for it. I mean, you can actually just look up uh, nonlinearity of dress states ladder Gerhard Rampe that, from Munich. Uh, that's the first time this was demonstrated in atomic cavity QED. Not so long ago, maybe 2010, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's it's in, it's an old field, but you know, a lot of experiments are not that uh, uh, old. Um, yeah, because it requires a lot of technological developments to see a lot of these regimes. But yeah, does that explain your question? Uh, yeah. 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 So you can do it in transmission, but not for this system because it's really lossy. 
yeah, so everything is very broad, right? So you kind of things blur. And when we did these experiments, we first tried to do it in transmission, but we so, couldn't really see it, yeah. So basically in between the um, UP1 and LP1, there are a nonlinear mode that will appear at higher intensity. Yes, in the, in the transmission spectrum, yes. Yes, because the, it's nonlinear because in order to reach this, you need two photons, right? Yeah. Yeah. Double energy, which is why you have to crank up your laser power to start seeing that. And then for third rank, which is three omega naught plus minus G root three, you have to be at even higher power, three photon regime, right? Yeah, I'm wondering what the uh, um, real application of that other than the scientific understanding. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, from this, obviously, you can actually do, there, there are a few things on the quantum information side, but then after the break, I'll show you classical um, kind of uh, optoelectronics applications. But in the, on the quantum information side, applications are generation of quantum states of light. You know, this is kind of a source of single photon states or two photon states where depending on the frequency, driving frequency, you can change statistics of light at the output. And you need to have different quantum states of light for quantum, you know, communication, sensing, a lot of different applications, right? Some people even talk about build, using large uh, entangled states of light for quantum computing, so-called cluster states. But in order to build these cluster states, you have, you, you start for, with single photons as building blocks and interactive. Um, and also entanglement between atom and field because you use atom or artificial atom as a memory. And then there are also classical applications because this is sort of the ultimate regime of um, interaction between semiconductor or, or, or mat other whatever matter and light. So you can use it to make uh, switches and modulators that operate at high speeds at le and really low powers. They're kind of controlled by single photon. So it gives you the limit on the operational, um, on, on the limit of simply on, the, on, on how far you can push up the electronic devices. And you know, you in most practical applications, you don't really need a modulator or switch that is operated by a single photon, unless you're doing something related to quantum information processing. Uh, but you know, it also tells you that instead of using you know millions of photons to to switch one light output of the modulator, you know, or switch, you can actually instead do it with a few dozens of photons or tens of photons e efficiently. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think we can keep going right now. Okay. So, you know, we just said that there would be also some classical applications of this. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to show you that. And, and, you know, also here, it's also related to this idea of kind of exciting higher order rungs of the ladder that, that Yishuo was asking uh, how, you know, you can measure these higher rungs instead of doing statistics measurements. I'll now show you what happens when you increase the power and how kind of how we kind of fill up and, and excite all of those higher rungs. But, from the perspective of a classical application, which is very fast switching with cavity QED system. So, so here, is, here is again the, the underlying 
story is that you have a quantum dot and then that's strongly coupled to the cavity and you're measuring transmission through the system. And when you have low power, you are expecting to see two peaks in transmission. That's a strongly coupled system, right? And then as you crank up the power of the laser that you're transmitting through the system and scanning the laser across the system, you know, those extra peaks, I mean, you start exciting these higher order rungs of the ladder and those extra peaks are starting to pop up between these two peaks, right? And they basically fill up the space between these two peaks. You don't see them as peaks here because everything is so broadened and blurred out that you can't identify exactly peaks. It's just filling up the region in between. So that's what's happening, but it's really excitation of the higher order ranks quantum mechanically. Classically, you know, people call this saturation. Uh, I mean, if you're thinking about your atom, you can at most kind of put one, one photon uh, of excitation into your atom. So if you bombard the system with, with photons, and if you, if you basically bring more than one photon per, per cavity lifetime into the cavity, then you will keep your atom constantly excited, right? So from the perspective of all of the other photons coming into the system, it just looks like an empty cavity because your atom is always exciting, right? You can't like excite that atom and lose one photon from the input. So it's just like an empty cavity. So that's, you know, what people are referred to as classical saturation, but really, just state slider picture is that you are exciting higher the ranks of the ladder and filling up the space in between. And the bottom line is when you're measuring transmission through a strongly coupled system at low power, you see peaks, and as you crank up the power of the input laser, you just go back to an empty cavity. You know, fill up the space between the peaks. So why is this interesting? I mean, it's interesting because you can use this property to switch transmission through the system. Right, so if you imagine that you send a pulse of light, and if that pulse is in the power range given by the blue curve, and if you pick the frequency uh, of that, that pulse to be to coincide with the dip of the transmission, and the bandwidth of the pulse to fit in the dip of the transmission, that, that pulse would just bounce back from the system. You know, it's kind of in between, it doesn't have enough power to reach higher order rungs of the ladder, but it's in frequency exactly between the, the, the two peaks of the, the Rabi split peaks of the first rank, right? So you just bounce back, right? But then if you, if you send that pulse escorted with another pulse, right? Then you increase the power, meaning you have more photons, you can reach higher ranks of the ladder. You're still at the same frequency, but you can still kind of reach higher ranks of the ladder that are lost here, and you saturate the system. So you are not really anymore at the blue curve, but you're somewhere maybe on the purple curve, magenta curve, meaning the transmission increases. So when they're together, transmission increases. When you have a lonely pulse, it's just bouncing back at this frequency. And you know, this is really, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with, with the digital circuits, this really looks like an end gate, right? Because you need two pulses together to have transmission to the output, but single pulse one and zero gives you zero, right? And zero and zero, of course, gives you zero. So it's like optical end gate that operates at a single photon level. So if you measure transmission through the system as a function of delay, time delay between the pulses, this is what you would see. Right, so if you if they miss each other at the cavity, it's kind of very minimized transmission, and then when they meet each other, then transmission rises, and then they miss each other again. So it's optical end gate. And you know the reason why this is interesting, of course, people do all optical switching all the time in optical electronics, right? They switch one beam with another because they have some nonlinearity in the system. But this is kind of the ultimate limit of nonlinearity. Strongly coupled ladder is nonlinear, right? And it provides ultimate limit of nonlinearity because you change behavior of the system at the level of a single photon. And there is nothing else where a single photon would influence behavior of the system. You need to have a strongly coupled system to do that, right? If you look at bulk nonlinearity, no matter how good nonlinear optical material you have, you're not going to see effects at the single photon level because in nonlinearity is not strong. So, you know, speaking of, of applications of strong coupling, if you'd really like to have the strongest possible nonlinearity to, 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 to observe nonlinear effects at single photon level, you need to have strong coupling. So here in this case, you know, the bandwidth of the photons that you can switch is limited by basically splitting between peaks in transmission. And that splitting is determined by what? 
splitting is proportional to 2G, right? This Rabi frequency. So in this case, you know, with our Rabi frequency, uh, vacuum Rabi frequency is in tens of gigahertz, and you can actually do this with at 25 gigahertz speed with 40 picosecond pulses. So you can do it really fast. Uh, and of course, you are operating it in the single photon regime. I mean, it's with really low powers. And you know, these particular experiments you can do in atomic physics system as well, of course, but it would be much slower because Rabi frequencies are much lower. So your bandwidth of the pulses that you can switch would be much smaller, right? You know, typically at, at most a gigahertz if you couple to photonic crystal, meaning you can't really make high speed devices as, as much. I have a question. Um, yeah, um, sure. If you, um, if you locate your wavelengths as a deep of the cavity transmission on yep. the left figure, um, then on the right hand side, the single photon is actually totally reflect that. That's in the ideal case. In real case, it's not completely reflected, which is why here in the cavity transmission, you see, I mean, even uh, you see some contrast, but it's not a perfect contrast, right? Oh, okay. you, you still have some transmission here. And that's because this deep doesn't go all the way to zero, right? I see, I see, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's one thing. So this is all optical switching. The other thing that you can do is electro-optic modulation, right? So electro-optic modulators are kind of key components of, of uh, photonic circuits and switching systems. And typically, you know, you can use electro-optic effect or you can use, you know, for modulators, something like free carrier injection to modulate the output uh, light signal. And, you know, increasing the speed and reducing energy consumption, you know, meaning switching energy per bit is kind of the most important thing in development of modulators, right? But if you use strong coupling regime, again, as we said, you are kind of really operating at the ultimate limit of nonlinearity. So you should be able to make a modulator that you know, sh should operate at lowest possible energy relative to all the other modulators. You know, and of course, I mean, this particular modulator wouldn't, unless you're doing some quantum information, it would not be particularly practical because remember that this one, you have to operate at cryogenic temperature. Otherwise, quantum dot is not there at all. But it does give you a limit on, on how far you can go in terms of modulators, OK? And it also tells you that there is a big intermediate regime between like single quantum dot modulator, strongly coupled modulator, and state-of-the-art modulators where you can improve state-of-the-art modulators, OK? So what is a modulator? I mean, a modulator would be, a, um, would be a device where you are controlling the transmission of the optical signal using some electrical signal, okay? And, uh, you know, you have, for example, continuous wave signal at the input and you are modulating the transmission using, using some electrical signal and that way you can produce some optical pulses at the output. So you're basically imprinting the information from your electric signal into the optical signal, okay? And that's important for interconnects in computer systems and so on. So here is how you can make a, a single quantum dot based modulator, right? So you have your quantum dot coupled strongly to a cavity. You have your input signal, which is continuous wave signal. And here is an electrode. And this electrode on Gallimard forms a Schottky diode. And I'll show you what happens with, with that electrode. So you pick your laser frequency, and that's a continuous wave laser, to be in between the peaks. Remember, this is a strongly coupled system. So the first rung is basically these two split peaks. Right, so you split, pick your laser to be here, which means that if you have no signal applied to your, your electric electrode, your laser is just bouncing back, right? Not transmitted, zero transmission. But then if you apply the signal to your Schottky diode here, it would form a depletion region right, around the Schottky diode. So you change its electric field at the, con at the location of quantum dot, right? And when you change the electric field at the location of quantum dot, if you took apply quantum mechanics, I'm sure you did um, uh, some, some homework problems with what happens when you apply electric field to quantum well. So then, you know, you kind of change the bottom of the quantum well and all of the energy levels change. The same thing happens with quantum dot. I mean, when you apply this um, voltage on the Schottky diode, you apply electric field here and that would change potential for electrons and holes in the quantum dot and it would shift transition of quantum dot. So you can DC start shift right, um, uh, quantum dot. So quantum dot moves relative to the cavity resonance, which means that 
it's still strongly coupled, but you kind of have a detuned quantum dot cavity system. But nevertheless, since you move your quantum dot, at the frequency of your laser, which is given by the red arrow, you are not anymore in between the, these eigenstates of the system, right? You kind of now can have a transmission because you are now in a detuned regime. You are not moving your laser. You're kind of moving the whole dress states ladder, detuning it and moving it away from the laser. And then if you go back, you know, remove voltage from the electrode, then you are go back, going back, you know, to the originals tuned system, your laser is in between, reflected. And if you kind of detune your quantum dots, then you can have a transmission. So if you're modulating your electrical signal, you will be imprinting this on the output optical signal. You're kind of modulating between this blue and green curve. And at the frequency of the laser, you're going between minimum and maximum transmission. Does that make sense? Right? Does that make sense? OK. So then, uh, you know, experimentally, I mean, this is this was also done. So here is your Schottky diode electrode. Here is the cavity. It needs to be strongly coupled cavity. Um, and then quantum dot you don't see because it's underneath the surface, but it's there. If you apply no voltage, you have strongly coupled system and two peaks, right? And you put park your laser at the frequency between these two peaks when you have minimum transmission, right? And then when you apply voltage on the electrode, you remember you are applying electric field to your quantum dot and you DC stark shift quantum dot. Yeah, you're changing frequencies of electrons and holes, which means you're moving transition. So when you apply voltage, you're detuning your quantum dot, right? And, and start shifting it out. So, so it's sufficiently large voltage. At the frequency of the laser, you have a strong transmission. You see, this is when you take cross slices of this, eventually you go back to an empty cavity because you detune your quantum dot so much out of the cavity resonance that you just have an empty cavity resonance. Okay? And then here, system is strongly coupled. So if you tune voltage between these two states, you should see transmission changes in the transmission of your laser. And indeed, you see that. So it's really modulator, electro-optic modulator that is controlled by single quantum dot. And you know, it basically consumes, in this case, less than one femtojoule per bit, um, control bit. Uh, and it can operate at 10 gigahertz speed. And the modulation energy of femtojoule is limited by the size of the region you need to deplete in order to start shift your quantum dot. And of course, you know, that could be eventually smaller because you can come closer here. But there is a trade-off. You can't really directly put your electrodes on top of the quantum dot because you will lose strong coupling regimes. And you also have to approach from the region where you are not ruining cavity field. I mean, it's not really that for granted by slamming an electrode on top, you'll get strongly coupled system and, and better modulation power. But this is still pretty good. I mean, eventually you should be able to maybe go below auto joule per bit. So that's, you know, classical application of, of strong coupling and tells you how, how far you could go in terms of, uh, of building, pushing out opto electronic devices. And, and so, you know, yeah, go ahead, please. So for, um, if you apply the electric field, then the, there's a stark shift on the frequency of both the uh, yeah. electron and the, cavity or what? Not the cavity. Um, I mean, unless you have strong electro-optic material, only on the quantum dot, but not in this case. You only have uh, changes when you apply stark shift. I mean, if you look at a quantum well and you apply um, uh, electric field on the quantum well, what is happening is that instead of having kind of rectangular quantum well, you are having triangular quantum well, and then you can solve for your energy eigenfunctions which are changing. And then here, the same thing happens except in three dimensions and you're affecting both, you know, your quantum well in conduction band, which localizes electrons and the one in valence band that localizes holes. So by applying electric field, you're changing energy levels, localized energy levels for electrons and holes. And that's why you are kind of, that, that's why you're shifting this transition outside. There are details here, you know, quantum dot is symmetric. Uh, it's um, kind of mostly uh, round, kind of circular, which means that uh, excitonic wave function is symmetric in space. So it's um, sensitive to electric field, DC electric field or DC start shift 
only to second order, which is why you see this quadratic effect. You don't see it shifting linearly. I mean, if you have first order dependence, you should, as you're cranking up voltage, you should see change and this, this peak move linearly out of this strongly coupled system. But you see it kind of quadratically. First, nothing happens and then quadratically jumps. And that comes from the symmetry of your quantum dot. Yeah. And so if you use some quantum emitter that has linear start shift, right? Then you can operate this at lower voltage and lower energy, of course. But the price you pay is that if your emitter is sensitive to, to uh, first order to DC start shift, then in general, it would also be sensitive to surface charges and other things in the environment, like nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, right? So you then you have issues coupling it to a cavity as well. So yeah, I, I just wanted to show a few more things. I mean, we talked about coupling of single atom to, si to single uh, cavity mode. And I said that James Cummings Hamiltonian could be extended to Tevis Cummings Hamiltonian. If you have multiple atoms or you have multiple modes, you just build it up. You add those extra oscillators there uh, easily. Um, and this is just one more experiment that shows how you can couple one quantum dot to two coupled cavity modes, right? So the spectrum of two coupled cavity modes is, is you have these bonding and anti-bonding states. And you looked at two coupled cavity modes in one of the earlier homeworks, right? So depending on separation between them, you can control the coupling and separation. But this is not strong coupling. These are just two coupled oscillators, right? Now, when you add an extra quantum dot into the system, you can get to the regime where all of them are strongly coupled, right? So then as you scan your quantum dot, through one of the resonances, you will see anti-crossing, right? So this is here, anti-crossing through for the first resonance, and then anti-crossing the second resonance. So to, to describe this regime, you will basically have two modes that are mutually coupled and one quantum dot, which is coupled to both of them. So you have to expand your James Cummings Hamiltonian. But uh, this how, is how can I see the anti-crossing? So anti-crossing here, here quantum dot is tuned, right, as a function of temperature. And, and these first big peak and second peak are these uh, bonding and anti-bonding states of the cavity. So as you're tuning quantum dot here through the first peak, you're seeing that you always have anti-crossing. You never really have a single peak here. So if you, if you map the positions of two peaks, this is what you see, right, anti-cross. Yeah. Okay. And then there is another, very close to that one, there is another anti-crossing which comes from anti-crossing with the other resonance, right? See this one here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's it. So that, but it's a more complicated ladder because there are two cavity modes that interact with the same quantum dot. Yeah. And they're mutually coupled. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes and I'll kind of set the stage for what we'll be doing on Thursday, which is weak coupling regime, right? And you know, weak coupling regime, when we started discussion of this, I said is something that's much easier to observe experimentally, but it's harder to analyze theoretically. Um, and weak coupling regime is the regime in which one of the loss rates of the system dominates. And typically the most interesting one for us is the regime where cavity field decay rate dominates, but you still like to have your atomic line with very narrow relative to the cavity line. Because if your atom is what we call a bad atom, which radiates in everywhere in non-radiative channels, it's not a very interesting regime, right? I mean, putting a cavity on top of it is not gonna help you see something interesting. But this regime here, where cavity field decay is stronger than the coupling strand is interesting because that means that you basically put your atom, it emits a photon into the cavity, cavity would leak that photon before it has a chance of getting reabsorbed by the atom. So you don't see this reversible interaction. You don't see Rabi oscillation. But photon still kind of recirculates the cavity sufficiently to change, to influence the decay of the atom, right? And this is, this is the so-called Purcell regime in which spontaneous emission rate modification occurs. And that's what we'll be studying, uh, I mean, on Thursday, right? So it's still a very interesting regime because presence of the cavity, although you don't see reversible oscillation, still influences atom to decay faster than it would have done in free space. Right? Um, so, you know, um, 
another way of seeing what is happening in this regime, I mean, it's, it's not like a strong coupling when you have reversible Arabi oscillation, but it's, you know, you put an atom, you know, decays down, photon goes to the cavity, it leaks before it's reabsorbed. Another picture is your cavity is coupled to continuum of free space modes, right? So through the cavity, atom is coupled to, to continuum of, of free space modes. And then atom decays, I, atom sort of, you know, is not really just coupled to one, one particular mode, it's coupled to many different modes. And it tries to, attempts to initiate Rabi oscillation with all of these modes. But Rabi oscillations would all have different Rabi frequencies, so they destructively interfere, and at the end you have exponential decay, right? So that's really what happens. Um, and of course, uh, you know, this regime, you can also observe with, uh, uh, you know, our quantum dots in the cavities. We will analyze that uh, next time. Uh, just before we, we do that, I, I wanted to kind of review something that you've probably seen, and I will not really spend too much time on this. And this is free space continuous emission rate. If you're interested in details of this, you can actually just read the slides or read the course reader. But Many of you have already seen this in applied quantum mechanics, for example, so I, I will not really rewrite. I just want to kind of review this in the context of James Cummings Hamiltonian that we already have. So let's say you have just atom in free space, right? Or your quantum dot in bulk semiconductor, which is basically like free space, right? So how do you describe that system as a James Cummings Hamiltonian? Well, you still have your two level atom, you have your field, but your field has infinitely many harmonic oscillators, right? That's what you have in free space. And then your atom interacts with all of these oscillators using interaction Hamiltonian that we already derived. So the difference relative to strong coupling regime James Cummings Hamiltonian is that you have a sum here and you have a sum here because your atom interacts with many, many different modes, okay? So if you wanna analyze the problem of free space spontaneous emission, you have to solve this Hamiltonian. And that's possible to solve in free space because you know what your free space modes are. And uh, I mean, the way to solve this problem is to, typically you kind of count your modes and introduce the density of optical modes. Uh, but you know, solving this problem is harder than solving strong coupling regime for a single atom and a single cavity mode, right? But you know, the procedure is exactly the same. Math is exactly the same as solving for Rabi oscillation. So what you would do is you would say, well, my initial state is atom is in the excited state, no photons in the cavity, right? No photons in any modes of, 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 of the system. From here, the system can go into any of the states where atom is in the ground state, and then one photon goes into one of the modes that it can interact with, right? So, you know, this having many, many different modes kind of complicates math. But other than that, math is the same as a solution for Rabi oscillation. So you would set up the problem the same way. You still have to solve time dependence trading your equation. You would expand the state of the system using original eigenstates of the system, which is EX zero, atom in the excited state, zero photons in the cavity, or atom in the ground state and one photon in the mode K, right? And then you have to add up over many, infinitely many modes K here, right? So this is probably reminding you if I remove these sums, it's exactly some here and some here and some here. That's exactly the same as solution for Rabi oscillation, right? But with sums, it's just solution for interaction with infinitely many modes. And you know, to solve this problem, you again apply all of these different eigenstates from the left, you form coupled system of equations, and then you have to solve this coupled system of equations. Again, without the sum, it's two coupled equations. With the sum, it's infinitely many equations that you have to couple. It's possible to solve this. I mean, you are still, you know, finding uh, from the second equation, you can find CG1, you couple it back into the first equation and you obtain something that looks like this. It's more complicated than the one that we had to solve previously, but it's possible to solve it. And typically people solve it by, you know, revisiting the problem of free space and finding the density of optical modes in free space. And I'm not going to go into that because I, and it's kind of funny that every single class I know I, I had in grad school that they were rederiving density of optical modes or density of, you know, states for electron in a semiconductor. That problem kind of pops up everywhere. It's all kind of the same, but it does. That's how you solve this problem as well, right? You don't add up uh, uh, over discrete case, but you go into integral and find the density of states. So density of optical photons in free space 
calculation is on this slide. It's pretty easy to find, you know, density is just, you count number of modes per unit frequency interval, right? And it's always like that. And then you, you find your, you first do it in K space, then you do convert it to omega space and, and you obtain the density of modes. And then you go back to this expression that we had on the previous page, right? You, you, and you express this as an integral and, and you, you use density of states instead of counting modes. <coughs> and that procedure is here, you know, and, and again, you don't need to know how to derive it, but I'm sure some of you have derived it before. And as a result, you obtain something like this, right? So what's the solution of this? C0 is the same thing that we had for Rabi oscillation. Magnitude of C0 squared is the probability of your system being in the state EX0 which is atom in the excited state and zero photons in all the modes in the system, okay? So when you solve this, you will obtain C is zero and this is a constant. So time derivative of, of, of this function is constant times C is zero, which means that this function is what? Exponential, Exponential. decay, right? Exactly. So you, when you solve this, you know, you will just find that C is zero is e to the sum minus gamma naught over two T and that gamma naught is free space decay rate. And here it is, okay? So I, I, I didn't wanna go through this step by step, but math is exactly the same. I mean, procedure is exactly the same as, as Rabi oscillation for, for atom coupled to a single mode, except that the presence of many different modes complicates math, but procedure is the same. And I think what is beautiful here is that, you know, if you go back and think, wow, when atom interacts with only one mode, you see Rabi oscillation. Why don't I see Rabi oscillation when it interacts with many different modes, right? Where is that? Where in math is that lost, right? That I get exponential decay instead of Rabi oscillation. And what is actually happening is, you know, if there was only one other mode, you, if there was only atom and one mode, you always see Rabi oscillation, right? Because there is exchange of energy. You send a photon to the field and then from field goes back to the atom and that's Rabi oscillation. But when there are many different modes, frequencies of Rabi oscillation differ. So you sort of have, you know, probability of the atom system being in excited state described by sinusoids that all have kind of different frequency. And when you add up all of those sinusoids, you basically just have exponential decay, destructive interference, because they all have very different frequency and phase and so on. So that's really what is happening here. And exponential decay uh, is a free space decay rate, right? So this is what you've seen also before is, a, is an Einstein coefficient. Uh, it depends on the atomic dipole moment. It depends on the transition frequency and all of these are fundamental constants, okay? And this is also why I'm, I was telling you before that you don't, never need to calculate um, dipole moment matrix elements. You measure spontaneous emission rate and you can extract, always extract dipole moment matrix element from the spontaneous emission rate. Okay, so this is free space spontaneous emission rate, but we'll see how it's changed when you have some material with some refractive index. And like the final note, uh, it's 250, is that, um, I mean, the, there is also a correction to this. If you try to solve it, we, we made some approximations along the way. If you try to solve it exactly, there will be also some frequency shift to the, the atomic transition frequency coming from the loss and coupling to a lot of different modes, which is what we call lamp shift, right? So it's not just exponential decay, but this probability of the system being in the excited state would also have an extra kind of frequency shift, which, which is shift relative to the frequency, transition frequency of an atom not coupled to a reservoir of modes, okay? So let me stop there, right? So we, we discussed free space spontaneous emission rate, which you can solve as James Cummings Hamiltonian with many different modes. And next time we will see what happens in the weak coupling regime when you have an atom coupled to a lossy cavity, which is sort of like the interface to many different free space modes. Okay. See you folks. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. See you on Thursday.